Hey, this is Dr. Allo once again. So this is one of my most requested talks. This is all of the research uh, regarding exercise. Now we did one on diet and I've given that lecture a bunch of times. This one is all, all the research and everything we need to know about exercise. Um, the most important thing for weight loss is obviously diet. Then comes other enhancements uh, with exercise. So we talk about, uh, is it even possible to lose weight with exercise? What cardiovascular reductions do you get from exercise? And whether you should use high intensity interval training versus moderate intensity, prolonged exercise, or low intensity exercise, which one burns the most fat, which one burns the most calories. Um, and then we kind of sum it up with what kind of exercise prescription can you give your patients or your friends, for example? Not every patient, at least not none of mine or not many of mine, can suddenly go from not even being able to get off a couch to running marathons or lifting weights or squatting or deadlifting or whatever it might be. Um, so this was an important lecture to kind of how to gradually get your patients up to speed when it turns to exercise functionality. We go over all the exercise methods. I think you guys are really gonna like this one. Drop any questions below. Uh, we'll cover it in the next topic. Um, please subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. Enjoy the lecture. So thank you uh, for having me once again. Uh, Quick brief introduction. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at two different uh, medical schools, Midwestern University and Ohio University. Um, I did all my training in uh, Chicago. I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, in Northwest Ohio. It's very cold over there, and I'm glad to be here. Um, so I'm a yeah cardiologist based on Northwest Ohio. I'm also a certified personal trainer, and I've been lecturing on exercise, fitness, obesity, and weight loss for a number of years. Um, this is probably my second or third most requested uh, lecture. Um, the one on uh, weight loss is usually the number one most requested lecture. And then the one on uh, uh, exercise and then uh, diet research are probably right after that. I have zero disclosures. No company pays me to talk about any of this. Um, objectives are understanding the different exercise modalities, reviewing data with regards to exercise and weight loss, reviewing data with regards to exercise and cardiovascular risk, reviewing how exercise modalities can support weight loss efforts, exercise prescriptions, final takeaways, and question and answer session after we are done with the main parts. Um, this is myself and my children here. Um, you know, the sooner you start a good exercise program and build good habits with your kids, the better. Um, this is my five-year-old. She saw me with two 45-pound plates on my back. She wanted to do the same thing. Um, these are two-and-a-half-pound plates, and no children were harmed in the uh, making of this picture. This is me. Um, there's about 50 pounds difference and seven months between the two pictures. Um, just so you don't think I... Uh, I uh, have no experience with this. I have actually experienced this myself. There's a lot of diet that went into this as well as uh, weightlifting. But honestly, as you'll see, diet was the number one factor in all of this. So the scope of the obesity problem is obviously huge. 79% of adults are overweight, 22% are obese, 16.6% of children are considered overweight, 5.6% adult, and 12% of children 2 to 5 years of age are also considered overweight. Obviously, this is a huge problem, uh, no pun intended. Um, the next slide here is, uh, I always like to show this slide. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, this is like, I always get a patient or a resident or a fellow or someone who comes up to me, a family member, says, hey man, I read that book the other day. And, uh, you know, it turns out you just got to eat seaweed and you'll lose a ton of weight. Or do you see the study that they did on uh, um, vitamin XYZ? Turns out if you eat a bunch of vitamin XYZ, uh, then you lose a bunch of weight. So this this on the on the scale here of the people's confidence versus their actual competence and knowledge base, people are super confident when they know nothing or read one book or watch one Netflix documentary, whatever it is. And then as they learn more and more and study the subject more, they realize that they know less and less about the topic. So literally, people have spent their entire lives studying this, and then someone comes up with something and wants to sell a book. Um, or they read a book or one study and they think that's the, uh, the, the greatest new thing. Um, so what's more important in determining your body composition, diet or exercise? Um, so if you think it's uh, exercise, raise your hand. All right, 10, maybe 15, 20, 20 at the most percent of people. How many you think it's diet? So still not that many people raising their hands, maybe 20 to 30% of people. Um, so if you look at the... Uh, 
the pie chart here, it's 97% diet and maybe 3% exercise. Now, depending on the study you look at or the research has gone back and forth, some anywhere between 80% diet and up to maybe almost 100% diet. And the exercise portion is anywhere from 3% up to maybe 15, 20%. So that is what determines your body composition, your body fat percentage, what you look like, what you don't look like. There are four basic exercise modalities. There's endurance, which is like your aerobic endurance or what we call cardio. There's strength, which is developed using resistance training or weight. There's balance and flexibility. Um, balance and flexibility is your ability to stand on one leg, uh, walk properly, bend down and grab things, your flexibility, you know, with regards to your joints. We won't get into the last two uh, very much, but they're all important. So the most important thing is to understand your total uh, daily energy expenditure, what we call the BMR, your basic metabolic rate. 70% of it is your basic metabolic rate. Non-exercise activity thermogenesis, this is like your daily um, movements that you do without even noticing, like you fidget, you walk, you talk, that your step counts, those kind of things. Those are all um, considered... Um, your non-purposeful exercise. Then there's a thermic effect of food, which it takes like, let's say, you know, X number of calories to burn off the amount of food that you ate. That's about 10% of your total daily energy expenditure. And then exercise activity, thermogenesis, this is the other 5%. This is the energy used during purposeful exercise. This is like if you went on a walk on purpose or you went hiking or biking or whatever it might be, you lifted weights. That's 5% of your total daily energy expenditure, which is not a lot. Um, a lot of people think they can burn off or walk off or lift um, all these calories off, and unfortunately that's not the case. Um, so here is about how many calories you burn doing 30 minutes of exercise. If you weighed 143 pounds and did dance, you'd burn 253 calories. Circuit training 311, the one that's the highest is running at a seven minute mile pace is 543. And obviously if you weigh 220 pounds, you're burning close to 1200 calories um, doing that. And you can kind of look at these over time. Um, so if we had a 200 pound person and they did strength training for 45 minutes, walking for 15 minutes, they'll burn this many calories, 800 and 152 respectively. If they did this three times a week, the amount of calories they're burning is 2,900 calories per week doing some strength training and walking. Um, this still doesn't add up to 3,500 kilocalories, which is the amount required to burn off one pound per week. So it's very, very difficult to manually burn off calories. Um, you would have to run, strength train, canoe, hike, whatever it might be, um, for an exorbitant amount of time to burn off enough calories to lose one pound per week, which is what makes it difficult. So there's a lot of studies been done on this. Um, here's the first one that we'll go over. Effects of aerobic versus resistance exercise without caloric restriction on abdominal fat, intrahepatic lipid, and insulin sensitivity in obese adolescent boys. Randomized controlled uh, trial. So a three-month randomized controlled study recruited 43 overweight or obese adolescent boys, 12 to 18 years old, who were physically inactive, which was quantified as no participation in structured physical activity over the previous three months except school physical education classes. All subjects were asked to follow a weight maintenance diet during the three-month intervention period to determine the effects of exercise without caloric restriction. So we wanted them to maintain their calories at the same amount that they've been doing previously. Um, subjects were split into three groups, aerobic exercise, resistance training, or control. The aerobic exercise program consisted of treadmill, elliptical, or stationary bike sessions three times a week per week for 60 minutes per session at approximately 50% of VO2 peak and increased to 60 minutes at 60-75% of VO2 peak by week two. So they had they progressed them uh, over time. The resistance training program consisted of 10 exercises such as leg press, chest press, lat pull down, seated rows, among others, this week, the, the week one through four protocol was to perform one to two sets of eight to 12 repetitions at 60% of baseline during weeks four through 12. Subjects performed two sets of eight to 12 repetitions to fatigue. So they did also progress that. While these are not the most challenging training protocols known to man, um, these were all adolescent boys who have puberty to thank for the plethora of anaerobic and androgenic uh, hormones. The data showed that after three months, exercise had very little impact on weight loss. Um, control group gained 2.6 uh, kilograms of body weight, plus or minus one. The aerobic group lost 0 0.4 uh, kilograms. The resistance training group lost 0 0.6. So the resistance training group lost a little bit more, um, a lot if you multiply it out, but still 
not a tremendous amount uh, of weight loss with this exercise program. Of course, they didn't reduce calories. All they did was either lift weights or do a cardio type program. Um, the aerobic group uh, lost the least amount of weight, 0.4, and the resistance training group lost the most, which is 0.6. The control group um, gained weight. The next uh, exercise uh, study, effects of aerobic or combined aerobic resistance exercise on body composition in overweight and obese adults, um, gender differences, a randomized intervention study. Um, another study recruited 75 adults who completed an exercise protocol in which they were randomly assigned to one of two exercise groups, aerobic exercise or combined aerobic and resistance exercise. Um, the aerobic exercise progressed from 15 minutes three times per week to 30 to 45 minutes five days per week over the course of 12 weeks. The combined aerobic and resistance exercise protocol consisted of the same aerobic exercise in addition to a twice a week strength training program, which consisted of six compound strength training exercises. And compound, if you don't know, means multi-joint movements like squats, deadlifts, bench press, overhead press, body parts, where it requires almost total body control and full body to perform these lifts. Six compound strength training exercise designed to work large muscle groups for up to three to six sets and 10 repetitions beginning at 50% of one RM max, one rep max. Uh, the first four weeks in transition to two to three sets and 10 repetitions at 75 to 80% of one rep max. At the conclusion of 12 weeks, the aerobic group lost 3.7 kilograms of body weight and the aerobic resistance lost 3.8. I'm sorry, the aerobic plus resistance lost 3.8, which although statistically significant is less than nine pounds. So they did lose some weight after adding uh, resistance training with aerobic and, and or aerobic by itself. So you can see that um, not a huge amount of weight loss, but that's not bad. Um, effects of a 16 month randomized controlled exercise trial on body weight and composition in young overweight men and women, the Midwest exercise trial. Um, this was published in the archives of internal medicine. In 2003, this was a 16-month study with 74 participants between the ages of 17 and 35, so mostly a younger crowd. They were assigned to either a control group or exercise group. All participants were previously sedentary and did not expend more than 500 calories on physical activity per week. The exercise was primarily done on a treadmill, progressing from 20 minutes at baseline to 45 minutes at 6 months. The exercise intensity progressed from 60% heart rate reserve at baseline to 75% at 6 months. Participants were required to expend 400 calories per exercise session and approximately 2,000 calories per week, which was achieved through the course of the study. Energy intake was ad libitum, which if you don't know what ad libitum means, it means they can eat whenever they want. Um, so they can eat as many calories as they want. We did not, they did not control for that. They just had them do the exercise. So energy was ad libitum and was measured at baseline and five other time points over the 16 months. At the conclusion of the study, the men in the exercise group had only lost 5.2 kilograms of body weight, while the women only lost 0 0.4 kilograms of body weight. So again, not a huge amount uh, of weight loss, you're looking at 10, maybe 13 pounds in the men and almost nothing, maybe one pound in the uh, females. Another study here, meta-analysis effect of exercise with or without dieting on body composition of overweight subjects, European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This was from 1995. A meta-analysis found that mean weight loss of men who completed 30 weeks of exercise was 2.6 kilograms. Women compared similarly on average losing 3 kilograms over the course of 14 weeks. So after 14 weeks, again, we're looking at 5 to 7 pounds total maybe of weight loss. Still not that good. After 16, that's almost a one and a half years. So this study was a meta-analysis. Effect of exercise with or without dieting on body composition of overweight subjects, European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This was a meta-analysis. I'm not going to get into the details. You can look it up. But a meta-analysis found the mean weight loss of men who completed 30 weeks of exercise was a measly 2.6 kilograms. Women compared similarly on average using 3 kilograms over the course of 14 weeks. So here you've got people doing either 30 weeks or 14 weeks. They're not losing a whole bunch of weight. 2.6 kilograms, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 6 or 7 pounds. Um, and for the women, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8, maybe 9 pounds, uh, 7 to 9 pounds, somewhere in that range. This is after 30 weeks or 14 weeks. Not a whole lot of weight loss. Definitely, they did lose some weight. It's just not uh, as much as we'd like. 
Next study here, effects of anti-obesity drugs, diet, and exercise on weight loss maintenance after a very low-calorie diet or low-calorie diet, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So um, a systematic review or these like meta-analysis are usually a review of reviews or a review of uh, studies. So background here, weight loss maintenance remains a major challenge in obesity treatment. The objective was to evaluate the effects of anti-obesity drugs, diet, or exercise on weight loss maintenance after the initial very low-calorie diet low calorie diet period so they were comparing these um, the results 20 studies of a total of 27 intervention arms with a total of 27 intervention arms and 3,000 participants were included with the following treatment categories anti-obesity drugs which was three arms meal replacement four arms high protein diet six arms dietary supplements six arms um, other diets, three arms, and exercise, five arms. During the very low calorie versus low calorie period, the pooled mean weight change was negative 12.3 kilograms. The median duration was about eight weeks. The range, though, was three to 16 weeks. Compared with controls, anti-obesity drugs improved weight loss maintenance by 3.5 kilograms, uh, meal replacements by 3.9 kilograms, and high protein diets by 1.5 kilograms, which is not very much. And... Where are we? And dietary supplements, 0.0 kilograms. So the supplements did nothing. Um, where are we? And did not significantly improve weight loss maintenance compared with control. So conclusion here, anti-obesity drugs, meal replacement, and high-protein diets were associated with improved weight loss maintenance after a very low-calorie, low-calorie period, whereas no significant improvements were seen for dietary supplements and exercise. So exercise and supplements had zero effect on weight loss. And this is... Um, after a uh, after looking at like a lot a lot of studies so you know it's very very important to remember that um, so what we can conclude from a lot of these exercise helps you not gain weight back that you've already lost and there was a study uh, done on this this is well known regular exercise attenuates the metabolic drive to regain weight after long-term weight loss so um, weight loss is accompanied by several metabolic adaptations that work together to promote rapid efficient regain so the problem is when people lose a lot of weight their body is preparing to regain it all back quickly um, so this part that I highlighted, exercise decreased the, re the rate of regain early in relapse and lowered the defended body weight. Your body likes to defend your weight and keep you at a certain weight. If you exercise, um, your body is, is more likely to keep you at your new weight or protect you from gaining weight back. That's something we definitely know. Mm -hmm. So the next study, beneficial effects of exercise, shifting the focus from body weight to other markers of health. So they decide, well, if exercise is not going to cause a lot of weight loss, what if we focus on other markers of health? Because we know exercise definitely does certain things. And if you look here uh, at the box that I've highlighted, um, the amount of body weight reduction was only 3.3 kilograms. And this is after 12 weeks of putting people on exercise. Um, 26 of the 58, almost half of the participants didn't lose any weight at all. Um, and their their mean then their mean weight loss was 0 0.9 kilograms plus or minus 1.8 so almost nothing. Um, so despite uh, attaining lower than predicted weight reduction, these individuals experienced significant increases in aerobic capacity, decreased systolic and diastolic blood pressure, decreased waist circumference, decreased resting heart rate. In addition, these individuals experienced an acute exercise induced increase in positive mood. So the endorphins you release from exercise have made them feel better. So the conclusion of this was like basically you might not lose a lot of weight from exercise. However, your blood pressure goes down, your blood sugars go down, your waist and comforts might go down, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are all good biomarkers of health, but um, there we, you know, you might not lose a lot of weight, so don't focus on that. Let's focus on this uh, instead. Um, next, diet or exercise interventions versus combined behavioral weight management programs, a systematic review and meta-analysis of direct comparisons. So in this study, they looked at, well, if we put people on a uh, diet or exercise and add in uh, counseling where they meet with a nutritionist or someone who follows up with them to see um, if that helps. So the conclusion was programs based on physical activity alone were, are less effective than combined behavioral weight management programs in both short and long term. So they found that you may lose a little bit of weight up front or lose a little bit later. But if you combine that with weight management programs or behavioral weight management programs where someone meets with you and talks to you, um, then that obviously helped a lot. And we know from 
uh, lots of studies on human behavior, when you have a social support structure that helps you and supports you, that you actually uh, get better um, at losing weight because you have a, a support system that, that helps you and supports you with that. Same thing with quitting smoking or, or starting a new uh, healthy lifestyle. All that stuff, any of those huge things make a big difference when you have a support system. So the next study here, uh, long-term effectiveness of diet plus exercise interventions versus diet-only interventions for weight loss and meta-analysis. I'll read the abstract to you, then some of the conclusions. Diet and exercise are two of the most common strategies uh, used to reduce weight, whether a diet plus exercise intervention is more effective for weight loss um, than a diet-only intervention in the long term has not been conclusively established, although we, we kind of know that now, though. The objective of this study was to, was to systematically review the effect of diet plus exercise interventions versus diet-only interventions on both long-term and short-term weight loss. Um, where are we? Studies were retrieved by searching Medline, blah, blah, blah. So they found a lot of studies um, from 1966 all the way to 2008. And um, they looked at uh, weight and body mass index, so they stratified the results by that. The pooled weight loss that they found was 1.14 kilograms um, greater for the diet plus exercise group than the diet only group. So not a lot. So one kilogram difference between the diet group and the diet plus exercise group. We did not detect significant heterogeneity um, in either stratum. Even in studies lasting two years or longer, diet plus exercise interventions provided significantly greater weight loss than the diet only interventions. In summary, a combined diet plus exercise program provide greater long-term weight loss than a diet only program. However, both diet only and diet plus exercise programs were associated with partial weight regain and future studies should be done. So even in the studies when they looked at actual weight loss, the difference between a diet group and, a not, and an exercise plus diet group, um, the difference was one kilogram when you pooled the weight loss. So even in these studies that showed that exercise plus diet worked, this is the part that I highlighted, it was a 0 0.5 to one kilogram weight loss over two years. That's one to two pounds or 2.2 pounds at the most. So still not really a big, big um, difference there between the two groups and not a huge effect of adding exercise to diet. Meta-analysis here from 2007, the effect of dietary counseling for weight loss. Dietary and lifestyle modification efforts are the primary treatments of people who are obese or overweight. The effect of dietary counseling on long-term weight changes is unclear. So they wanted to do a meta-analysis to find out um, if dietary counseling uh, helped, the conclusion, I'm going to highlight it, and I want to go through the whole thing, um, but it was they looked at stuff that was about 12 months long. Dietary counseling interventions produce modest weight losses that diminish over time. Um, so we know this when someone is counseling you or talking to you about weight loss all the time, you get after it and, and be a little more uh, compliant, but then as you stop doing that, you uh, aren't as compliant as much anymore. So that's what happened with this study. Now, here's from the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. They, they did a study on w weight change in kilograms um, by percentage uh, and and uh, or kilograms in and of itself. So the control group did nothing. That's that gray line there. Basically stayed flat. Maybe lost a little bit of weight, but it came back uh, I know, what, from zero to maybe one kilogram at the most. The calorie restriction group with exercise is that blue turquoise colored line. They lost about eight kilograms. Calorie restriction only lost eight and a half, almost nine kilograms. And the very low calorie diet group lost a lot of weight. They lost 11 kilograms. And this is looking at almost two years. Um, so you'll notice that the group that did calorie restriction only lost about a kilo, a kilo and a half more than the group that added in exercise. And we find this over and over and over again in almost all of these exercise based studies. So Previously, we thought there was a linear model. So your total daily energy expenditure is, uh, remember we said before, is mostly comprised of your basic metabolic rate, that 70%, plus the NEAT that you do, the non-exercise thermogenesis, plus the uh, thermic effect of food. Um, and then there's that 5%, which was your actual exercise thermogenesis or your physical activity. So we used to think, if you look at this model here, Obviously, you can't change your BMR or all those other factors, but you can change your physical activity. You can increase your NEAT or start running or walking or you know start an exercise program. We used to think that the more physically active you are, the more calories you can burn. So like 
Um, if I do three hours of CrossFit a week, I can burn 10 million calories. Um, they found out that that's not actually true. Um, otherwise, we could just increase the amount of work we do or the amount on the treadmill that we do and just burn more and more calories. But obviously, that's not true. Um, the, it's Now, the constrained model is what we believe, is that up, you can burn off a certain amount of calories up to a certain point. Like if I get on a treadmill every night and I run or walk or jog for two to three miles, once I burn about two to 300 calories, you know, your body starts limiting the amount that you can burn over that. So, or if you do CrossFit three times a week or lift weights eight times a week, whatever it is, your body adapts or somehow caps that your ability uh, to burn even more weight. So this model here where you see the physical activity kind of goes up initially, you're burning more calories, but then it's capped at a certain number. Now we don't know what those numbers are. They've done some studies where they had somebody on a treadmill for the very first time. They, they run three miles and they burn 300 calories. They do it again. Two, three days later, they burn a little bit less. Two, three days later, they get a little, they burn a little less. Now a lot of that is your body adapting, um, and becoming more endurance uh, adapted and better at cardiovascular activity, but a lot of it is also your body uh, becoming a little more efficient with calories and activity and capping the amount of calories that you can actually burn off with your activity. So you, you want to just keep that in mind when you're deciding if you want to manually try to run off your calories. Um, so here's the sort of the study that goes with that constrained uh, model. Uh, constrained total energy expenditure and metabolic adaptation to physical activity in adult humans. A summary, current obesity prevention strategies recommend increasing daily physical activity, assuming that increased activity will lead to corresponding increases in total energy expenditure and prevent or reverse energy imbalance and weight gain. Such additive total energy expenditure models are supported by exercise intervention and accelerometry studies reporting positive correlations between physical activity and total energy expenditure, but are challenged by ecological studies in humans and other species showing that more active populations do not have higher total energy expenditure. Here we tested a constrained total energy expenditure model in which total energy expenditure increases with physical activity at low activity levels, but plateaus at higher activity levels as the body adapts to maintain total energy expenditure within a narrow range. We compared total energy expenditure measured using doubly labeled water against physical activity measured using accelerometry for a large sample of almost 330, 332 patient uh, adults living in five populations. After adjusting for body size and composition, total energy expenditure was positively correlated with physical activity, but the relationship was markedly stronger over the lower range of physical activity. For subjects in the upper range of physical activity, total energy expenditure plateaued, supporting a constrained energy expenditure model. Body fat percentage and activity intensity appear to modulate the metabolic response to physical activity. Models of energy balance employed in public health should be revised to better reflect the constrained nature of total energy expenditure and the complex effects of physical activity on physiology. So here... They proved scientifically, without question, that when you first start something or at lower activity levels, you can burn off calories. If you get on the treadmill 15, 20 minutes a night, walking kind of slowly, maybe light jogging for 30, 40 minutes, you will increase your energy expenditure. However, after a certain point, and we may not know exactly what that point is, more studies need to be done, but after a certain point, you're not burning any more calories. You, you're just doing it for fun. Um, it's it's not a waste of time, but you could argue that it's not as uh, effective if you're doing it to burn off calories. So another study that we went over a little bit in the diet lecture is um, a study regarding um, obesity and appetite control. We'll kind of skip through this one a little bit. You can read the key points here, but the more overweight you are, the more fat mass you carry, the, the more dysregulated your appetite is. If you notice people who are overweight, they eat more and they don't realize they're actually full. People who are leaner um, do realize they're full and, and will stop eating usually. Um, it, it will stop eating when they're full. Um, you can go through that. Now, we don't know which one caused which or which came first, but still, people who are overweight generally not very good at detecting their appetite. So, um, back to this original study about the capped uh, exercise. Body adapts to exercise to the point where you are burning less and less calories. Um, and because you improve your cardiovascular endurance, it does become easier and you can do it using less calories. So there's two adaptive mechanisms going on. One of them is your body adapting to what you're doing and one of them is you uh, 
being able to do it a lot easier because you are more cardiovascularly uh, endured and can do it better with less, you know, less being tired and less energy needing to be expended because you're getting better at it. Um, the next study here, physical activity, total and regional obesity, dose response considerations. This review was undertaken to determine whether exercise induced weight loss was associated with corresponding reductions in total abdominal and visceral fat in a dose response manner. So they also um, did a search, and I won't go through the uh, details, but the conclusion was in in response to well-controlled short-term trials, increasing physical activity expressed as energy expended per week is positively related to reductions in total adiposity in a dose-response manner. So the more physical activity you do, the more likely you are to reduce total fat. Um, although physical activity is associated with a reduction in abdominal and visceral fat, there is no there's insufficient evidence to determine a dose-response relationship. So when it comes to abdominal and visceral fat, there's no relationship. But overall, fat does go down. Also, the line that I underlined, accordingly, short-term studies report reductions in body weight uh, and total fat that are threefold higher than those reported in longer-term studies. So when they were doing this meta-analysis, they found that anytime somebody starts an exercise program, um, they lose some weight up front. You know, for the first two to three months, people will lose a lot more weight. But as you continue that program, the weight loss stops. You adapt or your body adapts or you start eating more calories um, and no longer causes fat. So, you know, I've had a lot of friends and I'm sure you have too. They picked up running or canoeing or hiking or weightlifting or whatever it might be. They started a new exercise type of program um, with any of the exercise modalities First month or two, they're doing great. They lost 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds, whatever it is. But then you see them, you know, like a year later and they, they have gained almost all of that weight back. So definitely that's a well-known uh, phenomenon. It's let it not, don't let it surprise you. Um, so exercise quickly. The amount of exercise you have to do to lose weight is time prohibitive. Burning an extra 500 calories per day would require jogging for five to six miles per day. Now that depends on how much you weigh. If you're a 80 to 120 pound female uh, or child, um, you cannot really burn that many calories. If you're 200 pounds, that's about how much you burn. If you're 300, then you would burn a lot more, but also it's very difficult to do that. Imagine a 300 plus pound person running or jogging for five to six miles a day. It's not that easy. Um, doing this may take 90 to 120 minutes. The amount of energy you can burn from physical activity is capped and constrained like those models that we showed. So it is good for you, and we'll get into why exercise is good for you, but also, it's not the most efficient way to burn calories. I don't want my patients thinking that they're just going to run off all their extra calories. So exercise is good for keeping lost weight off, uh, but will not help you lose new weight. Let's put it that way. It can in the beginning, like we said, for the first two or three months, it will. But once you get that kickstart, you kind of catch back up again. Eating less and healthier is the key. Exercise suppresses and or increases appetite. In some people, it depresses uh, appetite. In some people, it increases it. Exercise activates the fight flight response and puts the rest digest system on hold. Um, exercise does lower cardiovascular mortality significantly, and we'll get into that. Obviously, I'm a cardiologist, so we'll get into how cardiovascular mortality improves. Exercise alone is ineffective for weight loss. I think we've beat that horse to death. So exercise does, however, improve your cardiovascular mortality, and we'll get into some of those studies in a second. It lowers your blood pressure, your LDL, your blood sugar, increases your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, prevents weight regain, it defends your new lower body weight, like we said. It may increase and or decrease your hunger. Um, it activates compensatory adaptive mechanisms, like we talked about, and it does not cause significant weight loss. Now, mortality... Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 2014, they had a study where they showed running at even a very slow pace for five to 10 minutes, just for one to two times a week, just once or twice a week, decreases cardiovascular mortality by 45%. So this is if you take a person and have them walk, run, or jog at a very slow pace. I think they only had the participants do like two to maybe four miles an hour at the most. At two miles an hour, for most people that's walking, at about four miles an hour, it's a light jog. And that, that just once or twice a week for just 5 to 10 minutes reduced cardiovascular mortality by 45%. Doing it every day reduced cardiovascular mortality by 50%. So there was a dose response. If you went from just once or twice a week up to every day, you did reduce mortality more. And it reduced all-cause mortality by 29%. So this also reduced the risk of you getting hit by a truck and dying um, by 29%. Um, so the next study we're looking at here is fitness versus fatness. 
um, in all-cause mortality uh, meta-analysis. So the purpose of the study was to quantify the joint association of cardiorespiratory fitness and weight status on mortality from all causes using a meta-analysis uh, meta methodology. Studies were included if they were prospective, objectively measured cardiorespiratory fitness and body mass index, jointly assessed cardiorespiratory fitness and body mass in index with all-cause mortality. Ten articles were included in the final analysis, pooled hazard ratios, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they did find, they broke them up into two groups, normal weight, unfit, overweight, unfit, and fit, and obese, unfit, and fit. So they wanted to compare, can you be uh, fat and fit uh, or not? So compared to normal weight, fit individuals, unfit individuals had the twice had twice the risk of mortality regardless of BMI. So if you, if you were not fit, regardless of whether you're overweight or underweight, you had twice the risk of mortality. Overweight and obese fit individuals had similar mortality risks as normal weight fit individuals. So if you were a little bit overweight and or obese, but you were fit, you ran 5Ks, you did whatever, but you fit into the quote-unquote obese category, which is a BMI of 30 or over, and you did some of these things and you were fit, then it was okay. Your, your mortality matched the lower weight or normal weight fit individuals. Furthermore, the obesity paradox, then does, does anybody know what the obesity paradox is? So the obesity paradox is when they when we used to think that um, elderly population, 65 and older, if they were a little bit overweight, that they actually lived longer. So furthermore, the obesity paradox may not influence fit individuals. So if you are fit, then it really doesn't matter. Researchers, clinicians, and public health officials should focus on physical activity and fitness-based interventions rather than weight loss-driven approaches to reduce mortality. Completely agree with this. You can have a BMI above 25, which mine was at a time. I was like a 29 or I was a 27 or a 26 at the time and then eventually a 29, but I was super fit. I played sports. I ran around. I coached sports. I ran some 5Ks. Um, definitely was considered in the overweight category and I have a lot of friends that are BMI over 30 that are overweight but play sports all the time and uh, are very, very fit. They are Their mortality rates are equivalent to those who are normal weight um, and fit. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, the next study here, uh, obesity paradox, uh, and cardiorespiratory fitness in almost 12,500 male veterans aged 40 to 70 to evaluate the influence of car cardiorespiratory fitness on the obesity paradox. And once again, the obesity paradox is if you're slightly overweight, when you're older, you live longer. In the on the obesity paradox in middle-aged men with known or suspected coronary artery disease, this study consisted of 12,000 men aged 40 to 70, 44 percent of which were African American, who were referred for exercise testing at the Veterans Affairs Medical Centers in Washington D.C. or Palo Alto, California, between 1983 and 2007. Fitness was quantified as metabolic equivalence achieved during maximal exercise test. Um, and was categorized for analysis as low, moderate, and high, defined as less than 5, 5 to 10, and greater than 10 metabolic equivalents, respectively. Adiposity was defined as body mass index according to the standard clinical guidelines, so like 18.5 to 24.9 is normal, 25 to 30 is overweight, and 30 and up is obese. Separate and combined associations of fitness and adiposity with all-cause mortality were assessed using a Cox, um, proportional, Cox proportional hazard analysis. Results. We recorded 2,800 deaths uh, during a mean uh, standard Asian follow-up of 7.7 7, uh, years. Multivariate hazard ratio of 95% confidence interval for all-cause mortality with normal weight. Uh, 18, obviously we said the normal BMI. Used as the reference group were 1.9, uh, 1.0 for BMIs of less than 18.5, 25 to 29.9, and 30 to 34.9, and 35 or more. Compared with highly fit normal weight men, underweight men with low fitness had the highest uh, 4.5 and highly fit overweight men the lowest 0 0.4 mortality risk of the subgroup. So it really correlates. The, the biggest correlation is with how uh, fit or unfit you are when it comes to uh, mortality. Um, overweight and obese men with moderate fitness had mortality rates similar to those of the highly fit normal weight reference group. Conclusion fitness altered the obesity paradox. Overweight and obese men had increased longevity only if they registered high fitness. So here once again, 
regardless of whether your BMI was normal, overweight, or a little bit more overweight or obese, um, if you are fit and can do 10 mets or more or 5 to 10 mets or more on stress tests, um, which is like an exercise protocol, then your mortality goes down and matches those um, that, that are normal weight uh, and also fit. So this is huge, obviously. We want people to be as fit as possible at any weight. So the next question that always comes up is what about cardiovascular or endurance type training versus resistance training or weights? So here's a study. Effects of aerobic training, resistance training, or both on percentage body fat and cardiometabolic risk markers in obese adolescents, the healthy eating, aerobic and resistance training in youth randomized clinical trial. So I'll just read parts of the abstract here, and I highlighted the part that I thought uh, was the most important. Little evidence exists on which exercise modality is optimal for obese adolescents to determine the effects of uh, resistance training, aerobic training, resistance training, and combined training on percentage body fat and overweight and obese adolescents. So they, this was a randomized parallel group clinical trial at a community-based exercise facilities in Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada. Um, previously inactive post pubertal adolescents 14 to 18 years of age um, with body mass index uh, at or above the 95th percentile for age, sex, and or above the 85th percentile plus an additional diabetes or cardiovascular risk factor. The interventions, they did a four-week run-in program. 304 participants were randomized to the following four groups for 22 weeks. So almost... Uh, half a year. Um, aerobic training had 75, resistance training had 78, combined aerobic and resistance training 75, and no exercise group had 76. All, partic all participants received dietary counseling with a daily energy deficit of 250 kilocal. So everyone was in a slight calorie deficit and either did no exercise, just aerobic, or aerobic plus resistance. The primary outcomes was percentage body fat measured by magnetic resonance imaging at baseline and at six months. So MRI is actually quite accurate. This is I'm glad they did it with MRI. Um, they hypothesized that aerobic training and resistance training would each yield greater decreases than the control and that combined training would cause greater decreases than aerobic or resistance training alone. So the results. Um, decreases in percentage body fat were uh, 0 0.3 in the control group. Uh, 1.1 in the aerobic training group um, and negative 1.6 in the resistance training group. The negative 1.4 decrease in the combined training group did not differ significantly from that in the aerobic or resistance training group. Waist circumference changes were 0 0.2 in the control, uh, 3 in the aerobic, 2.2 uh, in the resistance, and 4.1 in the combined training group. So more, the most, was in the combined training group. Um, in per protocol analysis, they had 70% or greater adherence. The combined training group had greater changes in percentage body fat versus the aerobic group. They had negative 2.4% uh, body fat versus 1.2, um, but not the resistance group 1.6. Um, so aerobic, the conclusions, aerobic resistance and combined training reduced total body fat and waist circumference in obese adolescents in more adherent participants. Combined training may cause greater decreases than aerobic or resistance training alone. So this program obviously showed that if you throw in resistance training, you get uh, better results, whether the weight in weight circumference and total body fat um, reduction. So the next study here, um, aerobic or resistance exercise or both in dieting obese older adults. So this one was done in adults and they were also dieting. Obese causes frailty in older adults. However, weight loss may accelerate age-related loss of muscle and bone mass and result in sarcopenia. Sarcopenia just means reduced muscle mass and osteopenia, which is reduced bone density. Um, the methods... In this clinical trial involving 160 obese older adults, we evaluate the effectiveness of several exercise modes in reversing frailty and preventing reduction in muscle and bone mass induced by weight loss. Participants were randomly assigned to a weight management program plus one of three exercise programs, aerobic training, resistance training, or combined aerobic and resistance training, or to a control group, no weight management or exercise program. The primary outcome was the change in physical performance test Score from baseline to six months. Scores range from zero to 36 points. Higher scores indicate better performance. Secondary outcomes included changes in other frailty measures, body composition, bone mineral density, and physical functions. Results, a total of 141, par 141 participants completed the study. The physical performance test score increased more in the combination group than in the aerobic 
uh, and resistance groups alone. So 27.9 to 33.4 versus 29.3 to 33.2. Um, so there was a 21% increase versus a 14% increase and 28.8 to 32.7, which was a 14% increase. So the group that did both um, increased 21% versus um, only 14% in the groups that did uh, one or the other. Um, where are we? The scores increased more in all exercise groups than in control groups. Peak oxygen consumption increased more in the combination and aerobic groups um, than in the resistance group. So obviously, if you do more endurance, your you know uh, uh, extra, uh, oxygen consumption is going to improve, especially peak oxygen consumption. Um, strength increase more in the combination and resistance groups. Obviously, if you're doing any kind of resistance training, you're going to get stronger, even if that's combined with cardio. Um, then the aerobic group, where are we? Body weight decreased by 9% in all exercise groups, but did not change significantly in the control group. Lean mass decreased less in the combination and resistance group than in the aerobic group. So if there was resistance training involved, you lost less lean body mass, whereas if there was no resistance involved, Part of that 9% of body fat, body weight that you lost, there was a lean body mass uh, decrease. So in the com in the combined group, there was a 3% decrease. Um, I'm sorry, in the there was a 3% decrease, a 2% decrease, and a 5% decrease. The group that did um, resistance training uh, obviously lost the least amount of body mass, and the same thing they found in uh, bone mineral density uh, at the total hip. Um, they found that the groups that had resistance training lost the least amount of bone uh, mineral density. So sort of their conclusion at the bottom there, and you can read the, the rest of this. Of the methods tested, weight loss plus combined aerobic and resistance exercise was the most effective in improving functional status of obese older adults. So definitely in the older populations, you don't want to do just cardio or just weights. Um, you want to do a little bit uh, of both because you lose less lean body mass when you're in a calorie deficit and your bone mineral density uh, is, stays a little higher. You don't lose as much of that. And here's the uh, chart that goes with that. This is the PPT score, which is what we're mainly looking at. Control group slightly improved. The aerobic group and resistance group went up. The combined group went up the most. See that blue line there? And then if you look at lean body mass, the control group here stayed the same. The aerobic group uh, lost a lot of lean body mass, which goes with the other studies that we've shown. When somebody does an endurance or cardio, cardio type of exercise program, they lose the most lean body mass. Um, adding in resistance training, um, if they did resistance training alone, they lost the least amount of body uh, lean body mass, and then a combined one lost some uh, lean body mass, but not as much as aerobic alone. So definitely, if your goal is to retain lean body mass and not lose much of it, you want to do uh, a program with resistance training only. Now, if you want your endurance to go up and a lot of other functionality to go up, you want to add in a combined program. Um, strength, if you look at this other one um, down here, F, chart F, if you look at strength, obviously with the resistance or combined, your strength went up. Aerobic had a little bit improvement in strength, not a whole lot in the control group, none. If you look at bone mineral density at the total hip, the control group actually lost, uh, actually gained some bone mineral density, and the aerobic group lost bone mineral density. We've known this over a lot of studies as well. The resistance group lost the least amount, and then the combined group lost a little bit more, somewhere in between the aerobic and resistance group. So definitely resistance training, which is weights usually, um, you protect your body the most, your strength goes up, your functionality scores go up, your peak oxygen consumption goes up, not as much as endurance obviously, but it does go up, and a lot of the other markers that we look at improve. Now here's another chart. If you look at just weight change, the control group lost almost no weight, maybe gained a little, um, but all of the groups that had aerobic resistance and combination therapy did lose weight. Now don't forget these people were in a calorie deficit. These are not people that did exercise alone. So the, the, con the contention is that with the calorie deficit alone, regardless of what exercise program you threw them on, they did well. And this was about a half a year, 26 weeks. So regardless of what they did, um, the groups that did 
any kind of activity, whether it was aerobic resistance or, combi or the combination of the two, did lose um, very similar amounts of weight. And we're looking at about 8 uh, to 9% body fat reduction there if you look at the other side of the chart there. So now there's the question of high intensity interval uh, training versus moderate intensity uh, interval training for improving cardiometabolic health in overweight or obese males. Um, the purpose of the study uh, to compare the effects of six weeks of high intensity interval training versus continuous moderate intensity training for improving body composition, insulin sensitivity, blood pressure, blood lipids, cardiovascular fitness in a cohort of sedentary overweight or obese young men. They hypothesized that HIT would result in similar improvements in body composition, cardiovascular fitness, blood lipids, um, insulin sensitivity as the moderate intensity group. So they took 28 sedentary overweight or obese men uh, at around age 20 with a body mass index of 29. With a body mass index of 29. Sorry, my phone is buzzing here. With a body mass index of 29 plus or minus three, and they put them in a six-week exercise treatment program. Participants were randomly assigned to either HIT or MIT, and they did uh, DEXA to assess body composition, graded treadmill exercise test to measure cardiovascular fitness, or glucose tolerance to measure insulin sensitivity, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, spectroscopy to assess lipid protein particles, and automatic auscultation to measure blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, the results were, so the results were, um, where are we? Participation in HIT or, HIIT or MIT caused uh, Training displayed, number one, improved sen insulin sensitivity, reduced blood lipids, decreased body fat percentage, and improved cardiovascular fitness. While both exercise groups led to similar improvements for most cardiometabolic risk factors assessed, the MIT group led to a greater improvement in overall cardiovascular fitness. Overall, these observations suggest that a relatively short duration of either HIT or MIT training uh, may improve cardiometabolic risk factors in previously sedentary, overweight, or obese young men with no clear advantage between these two specific regimens. So this is, you know, kind of depends when I tell patients if they want to do HIT training, which is a high intensity interval training, um, or a moderate uh, level of activity type training. They can they can pick either one. Um, both work, and they both seem to work for this. Um, but because the moderate um, intensity training is more prolonged, usually HIT training is usually you know five, ten, maybe 20, 20 minutes at the most. The moderate intensity, people are on the treadmill for like an hour, uh, sometimes longer. That re that resulted in greater improvement in overall cardiovascular fitness. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If they want just overall cardiovascular fitness, tell them you know what, just go for a one hour a day walk, or just get on a treadmill and walk. Um, for, as, for as long as you possibly can. So the next study here, effect of combined aerobic and resistance training versus aerobic training alone in individuals with coronary artery disease. So now they're looking at coronary artery disease and they're looking at whether resistance training um, or just aerobic training in cardiac rehab is better. Because, you know, after an MI, after somebody has stents or cabbage or valve replacement, or whatever it is, CHF, we put them in basically an aerobic training program, which is what cardiac rehab is. It's phase two cardiac rehab. So the designs and methods to compare the effect of um, aerobic training and combi with combined uh, resistance training versus aerobic training uh, alone. They searched Medline and found a lot of studies, and they, they put all of this in there. Um, the results, 12 studies met the criteria with 229 patients at aerobic training and 275 uh, with combined training compared with Aerobic training combined therapy or combined training decreased percent body fat by 2.3%, decreased trunk fat, uh, and increased fat-free mass by 0 0.9 kilograms. So their, their lean body mass went up um, in three studies. Similarly, combined therapy was associated with larger increases in lower body strength um, and upper body strength. And then compared to aerobic training, combined training improved peak work capacity. And there was a trend for combined therapy to increase VO2 peak. Um, qualitative analysis uh, data also favors, for quality of life data, also favors combined therapy or combined training. Study withdrawals were similar for both types. No serious adverse events were reported. Conclusion, combined training or um, 
is more effective than aerobic training at improving body composition, strength, and some indicators of cardiovascular fitness, and does not compromise study completion or safety when compared to aerobic training. A lot of people think, well, it's dangerous to have the elderly or heart attack patients to start lifting weights. Or, you know, why should we tell our elderly patients to lift weights? Well, their quality of life goes up, their cardiorespiratory fitness goes up, they get stronger, their body composition improves, they lose body fat, they gain lean body mass, they get stronger in many ways. So even after an MI or with coronary artery disease, this is actually a good idea. Bone loss, strength training stops bone loss and builds muscle in postmenopausal breast cancer survivors, a randomized control study. Now, this is something we've known for a very long time. Um, strength training, we know, increases your bone mineral density and or halts it and can reverse it. So I highlighted this. I'm not going to go through all of it. Increases in lean mass from resistance plus impact training were greatest among women currently taking aromatase inhibitors compared to controls not on this therapy. Our combined program of resistance and impact exercise reduced risk factors for fracture among postmenopausal breast cancer survivors and may particularly be relevant for breast cancer survivors on aromatase inhibitors because of the additional benefits of exercise on muscle mass um, that could reduce falls. So this is obviously um, very important and we've known this for quite some time. Um, the next study here, what about aging? So a lot of my patients and, and people I know, like, man, once I start lifting weights and lost weight and started running, I think like I've taken 20 years off my life. Um, and there is some truth to that. Resistant training reduces age and geography-related physical uh, function discrepancies in older adults. So comorbidities affecting physical function increase with advanced age and rural living. We, we've known for a long time that people out in the rural areas may not be as healthy or look as old or, you know, as their like healthy uh, age. Their real age is a lot older than people who live in more uh, suburban areas. Um, or urban areas, I should say. This study investigated the degree of benefit from resistance training in older adults based on age, location, and age being 50 to 89 years, location being urban versus rural, and program duration, 10 versus 8 weeks. 260 participants completed pre- and post-program dynamic and static tasks and flexibility testing, paired and independent t-tests, and one-way repeated measures, and ANOVAs were used to test the group improvements. All ages improved from performance with a very, very uh, significant uh, findings 0 0.02 but those in their 50s improved flexibility the most and those in their 60s improved 30 STS more and tandem balance less than those in their 80s both rural and urban participants improved in all areas but rural participants reported greater improvements in tandem balance both eight and eight both 10 and eight week classes improved performance but eight-week participants improve dynamic tasks and tandem balance more. Resistance training can reduce functional discrepancies in older adults and rural residents. So um, you can sort of turn back the clock or, or resistance training um, and or exercise training it can be the fountain of youth. This is resistance training, can be the fountain of youth. Um, so this is another study here. Two different... Um, Effect of two different weight loss rates on body composition and strength and power laid performance in elite athletes. Now, this is an elite athletes. Not very many of my patients are elite athletes. But um, here's a study that, that looked at this. And I, and I feel like we can use this data to uh, correlate it to our patients or extrapolate it to our patients. When weight loss is necessary, athletes are advised to accomplish it gradually at a rate of 0.5 to 1 kilogram per week, or we say 0.5 to 1% of your total body weight per week. However, it is possible that losing 0.5 kilograms per week is better than 1 kilogram per week in terms of preserving lean body mass and performance. We know that the faster you lose the weight, the more likely you are to, to lose lean body mass. That's why bodybuilders, when they go on a bulking phase, they put on a lot of fat and muscle, and then they want to lose the fat slowly, and they don't crash diet, because then you're going to lose all that muscle that you just spent, you know, 10, 12 weeks building, or the last year building. So um, they followed energy-restricted diets, promoting the predetermined uh, weekly um, weight loss rates based on their calculations. You know, we want this group to lose about 0.5 kilos per week and this group to lose, you know, a little bit faster at one kilo per week. They tested all their things and the conclusion is lean body mass increased in the slow rate by 2.1% whereas it was unchanged in the faster rate of weight loss, um, with significant differences between the groups. In conclusion, data from the study suggests that athletes who want to gain lean body mass and increase one rep 
Uh, max strength during a weight loss period combined with strength training should aim for a weekly body weight loss of 0.7%, which is about what we tell uh, people nowadays is you want to lose about 0.5, 0.5 to 1% of your body mass per week and you want to do it slowly. For most um, 200 pound people, you're looking at about pound to two pounds per week. Um, and if you do it this way with strength training, you actually will preserve your lean uh, body mass. So another study here, the effect of 12 weeks of aerobic resistance or com combination exercise training on cardiovascular risk factors in the overweight and obese in a randomized trial. Um, so here, the background evidence suggests that exercise training improves cardiovascular risk factors. However, it is unclear whether health benefits are limited to aerobic training or if other exercise modalities such as resistance training or a combination are as effective or more effective in the overweight and obese. The aim of this study was to investigate whether 12 weeks of moderate intensity aerobic resistance or combined exercise training would induce a sustained and sustained improvements in cardiovascular risk profile, weight, and fat loss in overweight and obese adults compared to no exercise. So the methods were a 12-week randomized parallel design exam, examining the effects of different exercise regimens on fasting, measures of lipids, glucose, insulin sensitivity, and changes in body weight, fat mass, and dietary intake. Participants were randomized to either group 1, which was a control group, group 2, which is an aerobic group, group 3, which is a resistance group, and group 4, which is a combination group. All of the groups contained about 16 or 17 participants, somewhere in that range. Data with now this is not obviously a huge group, um, but it's hard to recruit patients um, to these things. Data was analyzed using a general linear model. Results significant improvements in body weight uh, for the combination group compared to the control and resistance groups, and total body fat compared to control and resistance. So um, there was significant change improvements in body weight. They lost 1.6% of their body weight for the combination group compared to the control and resistance group. And they found total body fat uh, compared to the to, to the control group was minus 4.4% and resistance group minus 3%. Um, so the, the combined group definitely lost uh, the most. Yeah, so the, the, the group that was combined obviously did the best in almost every category, and we'll look at these charts on the side that I uh, made larger here. But let me read the conclusion. 12-week training program comprising of resistance or combination exercise at moderate intensity for 30 minutes, five days a week, resulted in improvements in the cardiovascular risk profile in overweight and obese participants compared to no exercise. From our observations, combination exercise gave greater benefits for weight loss, fat loss, and cardiorespiratory fitness than aerobic and resistance training modalities um, alone. Therefore, combination exercise training should be recommended for overweight and obese adults. Now, if you look at these charts, if you look at uh, chart A, um, and if you look at the, the control group is this group here, they actually gained weight. The next group is aerobic. They lost about 0.5, maybe 0.6. The resistance training group lost a little bit more. Um, and then by week 12, those patterns kind of continued. They didn't lose that much more. But the combined group, which is this one at the end, B, um, the combination group uh, definitely lost the most weight. Same thing with BMI. The combination group at 8 weeks and 12 weeks lost the most. And if you look at body fat percentage in grams, the uh, uh, aerobic group uh, here uh, lost weight. The resistance group lost less, but then the combined group lost the most. Um, when you look at body fat percentage, the aerobic group and resistance group lost about the same amount of body fat percentage, but the combination group lost the most. If you look at VO2 mask, which is your cardiorespiratory fitness, and that's how they measure it, um, the group that did nothing went down. The aerobic group improved a little. The resistance group improved a little more, which is interesting that the resistance group actually did better than the aerobic group in their VO2 max. Um, so there's something there when you actually work out your muscles. And the combination group obviously did the best, almost double um, any other category, which is huge. So back to our weight loss model. So is it just a matter of calories in versus calories out? You know, we get this debate all the time. Um, calories in make a huge difference. Obviously, you want to lose weight. You've got to reduce your calories. The part that's almost difficult to control or the part that has the le least impact is the calories out. We've gone through hundreds of studies over the years and getting the calories out to improve or get better is very, very difficult. As you've noticed on almost all these studies, you lose a few pounds here and there, 
maybe 9 to 15 at the most, but it's very, very difficult to control calories out. So I stress to my patients, if you can control calories in, sure, you should work out and exercise and do all that because it's good for you. And you've, as you've noticed, all the huge health benefits come from that. But definitely, calories out is something that's very, very difficult um, to control. So back to our little bit of these conclusions. 97% of weight loss can be achieved with diet alone. Exercise is very, very good for your cardiovascular health. Not necessary for weight loss. And my biggest pet peeve is when doctors say to patients, well, the only way to lose weight is diet and exercise. When you throw in the and exercise part, most of these patients that I have could never exercise. They view exercise as like running on a treadmill or biking or hiking or lifting weights or whatever it is. They don't. They can't even get out of a chair most of the time. And, and even walking to the bathroom is hard, hard work. So for them, it's very, very difficult to imagine any kind uh, of exercise. And when you try to tell people, well, you know, it's easy. You just got to uh, start lifting weights or start walking or start doing something else. They're looking at you like you're crazy. So don't say that. You're giving them a built-in excuse to think they can never lose weight because they can never exercise. So tell them, look, start with diet. You cut out your calories. You do this. Let's put you on a diet. Go see a registered dietitian. You get your calories down. You lose a good 10, 15% of your body weight. Maybe now you can start walking. Go on a daily walk. Start with two minutes a day, then five minutes a day, then seven minutes a day, you know, so on and so forth. Add in as much as you can over time. Um, one thing I like to uh, illustrate here is if you put a 200 pound person on a treadmill and they walk or jog for three miles, they burn about 300 calories. If they lift, if a 200 pound person just does body weight squats for two minutes straight, they burn also about 300 calories. That's just two minutes of resistance training. Now you, you'll find studies and other things that say, well, no, you really don't burn that much doing squats. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. Um, but one plain bagel with cheese is also 300 calories. You can just not eat that. And that will probably be the fastest way to get rid of 300 uh, calories. So exercise, weights and resistance training is much more effective than running on a treadmill. Um, it, it does increase your BMR, as we've shown in some of these studies. Explosive runs and sprints if you can. And it's especially true for women and people with lower metabolism. So lift weights to try to burn more calories. Also, when you put on muscle mass... Your BMR can go up. Now, there have been studies that show that your BMR doesn't go a whole, up a whole lot when you add muscle. But there are other studies that do show that adding muscle mass uh, does increase your, your BMR by about anywhere from, they said, 6 to 8 calories per pound of muscle up to like 60 to 80 calories per pound uh, of muscle. So we don't know. The truth is probably somewhere in between. But definitely um, adding on some muscle increases your basic metabolic rate because your body needs to upkeep that new lean body mass. So weight training versus cardio, anyone can lift weight, and, and everyone does every day. When you get up out of bed, you've just lifted your body weight. When you squat down to grab something, you've lifted your body weight. Um, but not everyone can run or swim. Um, running is a very difficult, not a natural uh, movement pattern, and, and people who are not used to that pattern, didn't grow up running or didn't grow up athletes, they shouldn't suddenly at age 50 or 60 or 80 or 90 suddenly start running. Um, it can be very dangerous. Most injuries that sports medicine people see um, are usually people who are 40 and up that suddenly decide to start decide to start a running program. So just be careful with that. It's not the um, easiest thing to do, and, and it can cause a lot of injuries. So definitely just be super careful with that. Um, weight training can increase your BMR. Obviously, cardio can too. Weight training improves your strength because you can pick more things up. You can brush your hair. You can sit down. You can get up out of a chair. It improves your mobility. You can actually walk to the store. You can help people take groceries out of their car. It improves your quality of life. It improves your body composition. Your lean body mass goes up. Your fat uh, body percentage goes down and improves your functionality. You can do a whole lot more. Um, this is something I usually show my younger uh, patients or younger audiences. Somebody who does diet and cardio only, they look thin. As you know, it reduces your lean body mass, that, as we've shown in multiple studies now. It can reduce your bone mineral density as well um, and reduces your muscle mass and fat level. So you end up looking this like kind of like skinny fat or this really thin. Whereas if you did diet plus weights and a little bit of cardio here and there, you actually look more muscular. You increase your lean body mass. Your fat mass still goes down and you look leaner and more muscular. Um, so this is the same thing here. Um, if you just want weight loss, you do a huge calorie restriction, do a lot of cardio, some restrictive, you know, very severe calorie deficit, you'll, you'll end up being 150 pounds at 35% body fat. If you do 
if you eat um, a moderate kind of diet, make sure you get enough protein, which we go through extensively in the diet lecture, but I'll link that below. Do some strength training, you get stronger, you have 150 pounds, but you're 20% body fat, much stronger, and you like the way you look much better. Um, if we had to give patients an exercise prescription, I would say um, start with cardio and resistance training, but definitely start with something easy that you can actually do. Now, the first, first and foremost, they have to be on a diet regimen, and you can go over the diet program uh, lecture if you want to, but they have to be on a diet. They got to lose some weight first to get started, depending on how overweight they are. If they're really overweight, they're 50, 60 pounds overweight or more, they might not be able to do any cardio or resistance training. They probably, you know, if they can't get out of a chair or even go to the bathroom or get out of bed, it's very difficult to tell someone you need to start exercising. So get them on a diet program first, have them re reduce their weight by 5, 10, maybe 15% of their weight, and then they can start um, an exercise prescription. So start with resistance and cardio. Start with just walking every day. It's the easiest thing. Add a little bit more time every day. Start with resistance training. Just pick up some light dumbbells, lift them off the ground, do different things. And we can get into the details of the best resistance training programs. I like to start people off on compound lifts um, because those are the most bang for your buck. If you do squat, deadlift, and bench press and overhead press, two to three times a week, just a couple sets here and there, you're basically getting a full body workout. Um, start at an appropriate intensity. You're not going to take a 70-year-old grandma and have her deadlift 500 pounds or run a marathon. You definitely want to start at an, a level that's appropriate for you. Make sure you're cleared by your doctor, or if you are the doctor prescribing this, make sure you give them something to do or make them work with physical therapy or rehab so, or for personal trainer. Get them started on something that's appropriate for their level of cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, you definitely want to start with a little more cardio in the beginning. They definitely, after diet, you definitely want to start with cardio. Transition to more resistance training over time, and eventually you want to get them to be doing more resistance training and just cardio here and there. Um, the weights should go up every time. If you're bench pressing 100 pounds this week, try to get to 105 in a few weeks, and then 120, and then whatever. Just go up. That's why you can't adapt to weights because your body, you can just increase the weights. And adapt your body over time. Try to, over time, improve your fitness um, and increase your weights. Um, this is a chart I like to show. Exercise intensity as a percentage of maximum versus what contributions each um, uh, energy source are supplying. So at a very low intensity level, you're mostly using fat. So if you're on a treadmill, you walk at 2.5 miles an hour for, for an hour, you're burning off mostly fat, or that's the primary energy source. You're mobilizing fat. The higher intensity, like once you get to HIT type training, which we talked about, um, you're using mostly sugar or glycogen. And then somewhere in between that moderate level, you're using a little bit of both. Um, so make sure you know that if that's what you want to do. This chart kind of shows the same thing. The longer duration of exercise, um, the more likely you are to start using fat. So when you first start um, a, you know, an exercise, let's say you start sprinting or start you know, running in a marathon, you'll use a lot of glycogen first, but as time goes on, you use more and more uh, fat. Um, back to this thing again. So it's not calories in is definitely the most important. Um, calories out is very, very difficult uh, to maximize or improve. Um, this study I like to uh, stress once again. I talked about this in my diet lecture a lot. Fat loss depends on energy deficit only, independent of the method for weight loss. So this was a study designed to compare the effects of two different but isocaloric fat reduction programs with the same amount of energy deficit, diet alone or diet combined with aerobic training on body composition, lipid, and cardiorespiratory fitness in non- uh, or moderately obese women. So... Um, this is an excellent study. They kept people on the same amount of calories. Like if you're eating 1,800 calories a day, everyone in the study is eating 1,800 calories a day. We created a energy deficit, calorie deficit with the energy only, and then we added aerobic training to the second set of the group. I'm not going to go through the details. You can read them, but everything improved. Um, body mass and fat decreased significantly um, in the uh, diet group. And... Uh, diet plus exercise group, but there was no significant difference observed between the groups. So body mass and body fat decreased significantly um, in, in both groups, obviously. Triglycerides, heart rate during submaximal exertion, lactic acid accumulation, um, insulin sensitivity, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, all that stuff improved. 
Now, the conclusion was, this study showed that independent of the method for weight loss, the negative energy balance alone is responsible for the weight reduction. So regardless of what you did, it was only the calorie deficit that mattered. Regardless of whether you exercised, trained, or didn't exercise, trained, if you were in a calorie deficit, that in and of itself is what caused the weight loss. So this is why I like to stress to all my patients, listen, first get into a calorie deficit. You're not going to lose weight by, you know, showing up to the gym once a month and, you know, walking on a treadmill or whatever it is. A lot of my patients say, well, you know, it was winter. I gained a few pounds in winter because I couldn't be as active. You don't have to be as active. We need to stop telling people that, that they need to be active to lose weight. That gives them an excuse to not ever lose weight and start gaining weight. We need to tell them, listen, forget about activity. It's winter. There's COVID. There's a pandemic, whatever it is. Don't worry about activity. How about you cut your calories? Cut out 500 calories a day. You lose about a pound a week. Start with that. Once you're down a few pounds or a few percentage points, and now that you can get up and start doing things, then do that. We want people to start doing that once they actually are able to. Um, we've also found in a lot of studies, I'm not going to go through these, the more muscle you have, it protects against cardiovascular mortality, protects against cancer, protects against chronic illness. Um, patients in the ICU um, do better when they uh, um, have more lean body mass and less fat mass. Um, they actually don't stay in the ICU as long. They're more likely to recover and get off the ventilator and all that stuff. So so the conclusion for the cardiovascular risk factors, I mean, we've gone through all the studies, but obesity and elevated BMI increase all inflammatory and cardiovascular risk factors. Calorie deficit and weight loss improve all cardiovascular risk factors. Macronutrient breakdown makes no difference, and leaner individuals have less cardiovascular risk. Now, if you want the details on all of this and all of the studies that led us to conclude this, please go look at the full-length diet research review uh, lecture. It's very long. It's similar to this, but it's about diet as opposed to exercise. So next slide here about calories out. Like we said, it's very difficult to change this. Do not eat back your calories that you burn off. Calories and exercise should be independent of one another. You should have your calories set to uh, weight loss or calorie deficit calories, regardless of whether or not you uh, exercise daily or four times a week or whatever. Um, exercise is just bonus. We really don't know how much we are burning off and it is usually capped. So despite all the studies and research that we have on exercise, at the end of the day, we really don't know. If you ran on a treadmill and the treadmill says you burnt 1,000 calories and your watch says you burnt 500, and according to your calculations, you only burnt 250, we really have no idea. We know that you were active. Um, and we know that those activity trackers, you know, if they say you walked 2,000 steps a day, we don't know that you actually walked 2,000 steps a day, but it's probably a good indicator that you were active. And if you did 3,000 the next day and then 5,000 the next week and 10,000 later, we know you've doubled or tripled or quadrupled your activity level. We don't know that it's exactly that many steps, though. Um, body recomposition is something that can be done. Um, it's a, it's when you uh, gain muscle and lose fat, as some of the studies just showed today. When you strength train while in a calorie deficit, um, that can help. This is especially good and possible in people who are new to training, Very people who are quite obese, people who are deconditioned lifters. You used to lift weight in the past, but you haven't in a very long time. You know, we're talking months to years. Or people on anabolic steroids. The final takeaways, I think the, the most important thing is diet first. So none of this lecture matters at all uh, until you've watched the diet lecture. And once again, I will list it in the description. But you have to uh, diet first. Start with what you can. Um, any, activity, any activity is better than none. So if a patient tells you, look, doc, I really can't do anything. I can barely you know, get up out of a chair. Tell them if you can get out of, out of a chair, then just do that. Get up out of your chair, sit back down again, stand up again, sit down again. That in and of itself is an exercise. That's similar to a squat uh, movement pattern. So definitely start there if you can't do anything else. Um, cardio and resistance training is where you want to start most people. Um, and, and a lot of times, even just cardio, if they can just walk for two minutes a day, then make it five, then seven. Um, but if they're extremely overweight, imagine if they're 350 to 450 pounds or more, um, they can't even get out of bed. They can barely get out of a chair. They, they use a walker or they need a scooter. 
obviously the most important thing is to start with diet first in that crowd until they're like fit enough to actually get up and walk. Um, then you want them to walk further and further, eventually add resistance training. Over time, you want to increase resistance training because as we've seen, um, the benefits of resistance training last even long after you've stopped the resistance training. So definitely add that over time and then decrease cardio over time. If they start out doing cardio three, four, or five times a week um, and resistance training just two days a week, slowly kind of switch those back so that you're doing cardio maybe once a week and it's kind of a moderate intensity cardio. Um, if you had to read one single fat loss book, I recommend Dr. Lane Norton's book. I've read every single book and every single study on weight loss that you can imagine. The fat loss forever is my favorite. Um, this is the golden fat loss pyramid. We go over this morning in the, calorie, in the diet lecture. Um, calorie deficit is the most important thing. And then make sure you get enough protein, lift weights, sleep, and then do some cardio. Um, these are the fat loss fundamentals. This uh, always um, is interesting. Non-negotiable is a calorie deficit. Highly advisable is eating things that you like, getting enough sleep, doing resistance training, staying active, picking foods that you can stick to. Um, stuff that most people don't wor need to worry about is what is the best diet? How many meals should you eat? When should you eat? Should you calorie cycle? Should you do cardio faster or not? What time of day should you eat? Should you eat before you work out? Should you eat after? All that stuff really doesn't matter, but that's the stuff that people like to focus on. They want to obsess over this. We're, li we're literally splitting hairs at that point. Um, stuff that you shouldn't do at all and is completely unnecessary is unnecessary food avoidance, cheat meals, juice cleanses, weight loss tea bags, self-proclaimed quick fixes, false promises. Um, losing fat ha will happen every day if you're in a calorie deficit, but your weight will go up and down and fluctuate because of water, hormones, not enough sleep, you worked out really heavy that day, whatever it might be. Um, you can find me at these various locations, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Some of these are private, so you may not find me, um, but definitely you can find me on YouTube. These are my kids, and uh, that's all. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. I'll answer the questions. Some of them I answered while we were talking, but if you have any questions now, please feel free to raise your hand, and we'll go through them. Thank you all very much for having me.